Welcome, WTF Fantasy Football, Jim Day, Mike Blewett, and my name's Tony Sincata. It is the Christmas Eve for all you fantasy football players. A Thursday night, the game start with the Bears and the Packers. We're recording the night before. Jim, are you a little fired up? Oh, absolutely. Real football. I actually got a draft. I'm going to be, going to be starting while we're still on the air tonight, so it's kind of interesting. It's going to be a long night, but yeah, football tomorrow. I'm all ready for it. I uh, I did one today at noon, and I might sneak one more in tomorrow. Mike, uh, any more drafts for you? Are you done? We're wrapping up uh, a guillotine <laughs> league. You and I are, but beyond that, I think I'm done. I'll do a little bit in terms of I have an over uh, a win totals draft tomorrow that I do with a few friends, so uh, I'm looking forward to that, and that'll probably be the last official one, even though I what may do What do you do mean a, a by few... a win totals draft? So over under for the year, where you uh, we have a snake draft, so uh, you uh, whoever picks first, we're going to pick the ra- the order randomly tomorrow morning. And then whoever picks first says, I like the Raiders under. Boom. Next guy ah, gotcha. gets to okay. pick a team. So Can the uh, same guy pick the same team but with a different result? Yes, sir. Okay. Can the, uh, not the same guy, but yes, I know what you're saying. You can. You, if I pick the Raiders over for the year, you can pick the Raiders under to cool. challenge that. Uh, That's but yeah, cool. it, I never did anything like yeah, that. Yeah, it's cool. It's only four people. We each do four teams. So. You know, if it starts to get pretty thin, and we each do a fifth team too for tie breaking purposes. So you get 20 teams into the league. Believe me, you're not that confident in your picks anymore. <laughs> for everybody out there that didn't hear a podcast last week, we did one, but we had a little technical difficulty and it didn't record. So you're going to get the same show, which was really good last week. So it should be even better this week. And Mike's here. Mike wasn't here last week. So right. we're going to cover the whole NFC. I thought that's why it was good. Sabotaged it. Yeah, yeah, that was it. That was <laughs> it. Mike didn't want a show to be good when he wasn't here. Here's the thing. I'm going to do a question I think that most people have about each team in the NFC. We're going to go down the list, get everybody's opinion, and we're going to start out with the Arizona Cardinals. And you look at quarterback Kyle Murray, he's been up and down in preseason. We've got a new offense, a new head coach. And, Mike, I'll start with you. i got to ask you, is Mr. Kingsbury the next Chip Kelly? Well, that wouldn't be a good thing in terms of the NFL, so I appreciate the way that you set that up. I have some concerns. I think in the rush to try to find the next Sean McVay, We're not exactly vetting the process of the guy being the total head coach. He may be an innovative offensive mind, but he also ran one of the worst defenses in college football for years. So uh, can he make up for that in the NFL? I have my doubts. I I think this will be a a good offensive experiment. Does it pull Arizona out from the doldrums into being a playoff contender quickly? I doubt it. A uh, different question for Jim. Jim, the Arizona Cardinals released their depth shot today, and they had three wide receivers with the first-team offense, Larry Fitzgerald, Christian Kirk, and Michael Crabtree. How do you rank them fantasy-wise, one through three? I'm definitely going with Fitzgerald first, Kirk second, Crabtree third. And, you know, I was telling everybody on the frenzy, had, there was a reason they picked up Crabtree. Obviously, they don't think the rookies they drafted are ready yet. And let's face it, before the the NFL draft, everybody was saying this wasn't the greatest wide receiver class. Yet, you know, once they get drafted and they're on a team, everybody in fantasy wants to have that shiny new toy, except these shiny new toys ain't ready. And that's why they went out and got Crabtree. Crabtree will be the number three receiver on that team, although he'll be the number four option in the passing game. I absolutely agree. Mike, anything different there from what Jim has? No, I I think he lined it up nicely. Uh, Unfortunately, Akeem Butler is going to be – uh, gone for the year. We'll see if Isabella and Keyshawn Johnson can break into it, but I, I think that'll be your depth chart for the majority of the year, unless Isabella can show an ability to get open in space if they're possessing the ball a lot, maybe he picks up uh, a decent amount of catches from the slot. Jim Day, Devonta Freeman is the in the top five paid running backs in the National Football League. Ezekiel Elliott, now the highest paid running back. Devonta Freeman's in the top five. Does he finish in the top five fantasy-wise for running backs this season? I don't think he finishes in the top five, but I think he has a good year. I actually have him as my comeback player of the year. I think he's going to have an excellent season. I think all the injuries are being made much more of than they really are. It's just what happens to running backs sometimes. I don't think it's a something we could see every year as happening. So I think he's uh, he's in good shape. Everybody's talking that he's he looks like he's very healthy and ready to go. I like him this year. 
I got to ask you, Mike, uh, the th- now 32 years old, I can't believe he's this old, Matt Ryan of the Atlanta Falcons. He was a Super Bowl champion for a half. Will he ever win a Super Bowl in his career? Loaded question because you know how much I like Matt Ryan. Uh, and I actually really do like the Falcons this year to potentially even win this division. I think they'll challenge. I just don't think that they'll have all of the horses to navigate through the NFC playoff race. Uh, so to answer your question, I'm going to have to say no. I think the odds are against him. Uh, but I say that with, you know, probably 60, 40, you know, I, I'd have to shade no only because I don't think it's going to happen. I, I, getting to that height and blowing it in the manner that they did, I think will be really hard to rid themselves of that. But uh, getting all the defensive players back this year and seeing positive results from guys like Freeman, I think will help them a long way. I, I think they're being vastly underrated this year. I read a pro football talk consensus today of the, all of their playoff picks and divisional and Super Bowl picks, and not one of the six writers there picked the Atlanta to even make the playoffs, and I think that's way off. I, I think they're going to make wow. the playoffs this year. <laughs> Jim, the Carolina Panthers, Christian McCaffrey, uh, the coaching staff alluded to maybe they used him a little too much last season. Do you see Christian McCaffrey not in on goal line situations? Well, that's what they're they're alluding to, but you know that's not really his thing anyway. He doesn't have to score from – the two or the three yard line, he's going to score from outside of that. You know, he's going to make scores from, you know, from the 10, from the 15. That's just the kind of player he is. So I'm not really worried about him much if he loses goal line carries. Let's face it, half of those used to go to the quarterback anyway. You know, that's one of the crazy things is that you always look at the goal line situation and people look at the uh, running back situation there. And I seen this week people drafting Kamara ahead of him in some instances. Have you been scared off at all, Mike, about the situation involving Carolina and the goal line work? Not really. I, I don't think it's egregious to have Kamara in front of him in the first place, but uh, I would have McCaffrey at, at one or two. I, I understand that there's – I think we get into situations where there could be a little bit of coach speak. Yes, they will try to protect him when they can, But when the money's on the line, and right now, interestingly, the Panthers have the second most juice to go over on the season. It's uh, minus 200, I believe, in Vegas right now for Carolina to clear seven and a half wins. So there's some positive thoughts about the Panthers clearing their win total. And I think when the chips are on the uh, chips are on the table, I don't think Rivera pulls them out to save them when they have a scoring opportunity late in the game. They have it. The Carolina Panthers and Christian McCaffrey. People all in on McCaffrey. I don't have him on a single team, and it's not be and it's not because I didn't want to draft him. Uh, the only time I got the early picks, I ended up with uh, Saquon Barkley. So uh, I'm not complaining, but I think uh, Christian McCaffrey would have been my second pick uh, in drafts out there. You listen to WTF Fantasy Football as we get you ready the night before the season kicks off. The Chicago Bears. Jim, I look at this team, right, and I love the offensive coach. I am sketchy about the quarterback. But I look at the wide receivers and I see Allen Robinson, Taylor Gabriel, Anthony Miller. Is this going to be a team that puts up big numbers on the offense? Not consistently, no. <laughs> um, I think they'll have some big games. But, yeah, I don't think they're ready to put up consistent numbers from week to week. I'm not really sold on this these wide receivers at all. I think Anthony Miller will get there, but he missed a lot of time in preseason with injury, uh, dealing with injuries. Um and like you say, that Trubisky's not fully there yet. He showed last year he could have some big games, but then he also showed that there were times where if you got after him, then he just lost it and looked lost out there. So uh, there's definitely going to be some growing pains, and he needs to, to step up into that role. He's got a perfect place with a good coach. Uh, he's got some, some pieces around him, but I definitely thought they would try to improve at, at wide receiver this year. Last week, the Taz said, hey, I got David Montgomery ahead of Tariq Cohen. Mike Blewett, who do you have? Cohen or Montgomery you picking first? It's a good question. Uh, Mike Davis often gets left out of the discussion here. I just wonder how much how many carries he steals early. Not much. I think I th- probably not much, but I, I, I think Cohen will obviously get more consistent touches, but I probably would rather have Montgomery because there's 
the difficulty with Terry Cohen, you know, having owned him on a couple of teams last year, is that you had Matt, you had big games followed by really small games. It's difficult to predict to predict the number of touches he's going to see per game. Even if Montgomery is a little cloudy early at some point during the season, you'll probably see more consistent touches from him. So I'd rather can, have Montgomery for that reason. Can I ask why do you think you're going to see cloudy out of Montgomery? Because I'll be honest, I'm all in on Montgomery. I, no, I everything just, I've seen from him is showing me that this kid is going to be a beast for them and take over almost all the work. I, I'm not suggesting that cloudy on his talent or his ability to produce. I just wonder if they take some time bring him into fo- into the fold, sort of like the Browns did last year. I understand we shouldn't compare Hugh Jackson to Matt Nagy, but I just wonder if there's an opportunity for other players to get touches early before Montgomery proves himself or before they finally cede all the carries to him. Just suggesting that maybe the first few weeks they won't throw him right into the fire. I say no, damn it. I say no. Montgomery. <laughs> Montgomery for president. There he is. Jim's got him. Jim, the Dallas Cowboys. There was a wide receiver in Dallas that used to be a thing. Uh, I don't know if he's a thing anymore. Fantasy owners don't think he's a thing anymore. Any chance Randall Cobb becomes fantasy worthy? Well, he can. I'm not going to say he can't. Look, it, it's really up to him. Can he stay healthy? Can he stay on the field? The talk all off season is that what is Kellen Moore as the new offensive coordinator going to do to this offense and supposedly he wants to switch it up he wants to create mismatches and you know Randall Cobb Tavon Austin those are guys that do that well they, they have the talent to where you can move them around do a little bit of everything with them heck Randall Cobb can throw the ball if you need him to so you know if they get him involved in all the different aspects and he can stay healthy then absolutely he could do that it's just that's the big question he hasn't been able to stay healthy in the last few years Mike, is Dak Prescott closer to Danny White or uh, Roger Staubach? Danny White. That's a <laughs> lo- I mean, I don't even need to expand upon that one. But Roger Staubach is an all-timer. He retired with the highest passer rating in league history when he retired. I understand it looks it pales in comparison to current day QB ratings, but Staubach is a Hall of Famer and an all-timer. Danny White was a guy that just sort of, bridged the 80s from Staubach to Aikman. They had okay success, but they didn't really do much in the 80s. You just wonder if uh, you hope Dak's a little closer to Staubach, but I think he's closer to Danny White. <laughs> Jim, Danny White got a lot of time on the field for a punter. <laughs> yes, he did. Look, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd say he's closer to White, but I don't think he's that close to White. Look, he, he's a serviceable quarterback. Um, he's better for fantasy than I think he is for the NFL, actually. But it is what it is. I, in that offense, with that offensive line, with Zeke back in there, uh, with Cooper there now, he, I think he puts up strong fantasy numbers again. Tony, all, all, right, that, all, all that to say he's going to get $100 million bucks. Yeah, Mike, real point. quick then. Steve Berline or Danny White? <laughs> is he closer to Steve Berline or Danny White? Yeah. I think Ber- is Berline better? <laughs> I, yeah, I like Burline, Burline had some good years. He did. Uh, he did have some good years. He had some... I feel like Burline's heights were maybe better than Danny White since Danny White was the Dallas Cowboys quarterback, so he got a lot of pub. But I think Burline might have been better. So I, I'll say it's closer Burline than White. Uh, there you have it, guys. We're breaking it Not down sure like nobody. Compliment. Yeah, nobody else's business. Nobody else breaking down punters for you as, uh, you know, we get it done right here. We're moving on to the the Detroit Lions. When you look at the Detroit Lions, and, of course, this is a team we expect to run the ball this year. And, Jim, I asked you this last week. I got to ask a question because I I don't have him on a single team. Kenny Galladay, is he overrated in this offense if the Lions run the ball as much as we anticipate? Well, no, look, everybody worries about, oh, this is a running team. You know what? They still got to pass, and it's still going to be close to, you know, even a heavy running team. What are you talking about, 60% running, you know, 40% passing? I don't even think it's going to be that high. So you're you're talking about, you know, less than 10% different between the two. So that means plenty of passes. If uh, Stafford is, again, fully healthy after last year with the broken back, then I expect them to pass pass plenty, and Galladay it will be heavily involved. It helps Galladay to have Marvin Jones back because last year that's where he struggled when he didn't have anybody else on the other side. 
And I think the rookie tight end, Hawkinson, is going to help as well. That's my next question. Great segue with Jim. Mike, who do you got, TJ Hawkinson or Jesse James? Oh, man. Rookie tight ends normally don't do anything, but this is obviously a very talented rookie tight end. I think it's close to a push, so why not just take the upside guy with Hawkinson? I'll tell you what, just on a sidetrack, we got a hurricane that was supposed to come through here, and uh, it wasn't bad where I live in Jacksonville. We expected the worst. So the city's been closed down for two days. People evacuated. And if you live in one of them communities that have a Facebook message board, it's always the craziest shit on there. So <laughs> someone someone had to let everybody know, FYI, the Sushi House, the Bamboo Brooklyn Pizza, and Liquor Store are now open in Bartram Park. Thank God we got that information. <laughs> one thing well, you uh, get, you, you I always want during a, a deadly storm is sushi. <laughs> <laughs> or Floridian pizza. Yeah. Oh uh, God. Yeah. Oh that's God. It. Green <laughs> no, no, Bay. No. Green Bay Pack is now. This we had last week, so I'm going to ask Jim it again. Jim, who do you draft first, Marquise Valdez Scantling or Geronimo Allison? I have gone with Allison just because he had flourished in the past in the role that he looks like he'll be playing on a slot this season. But both guys have shown the ability at times, and of course, on the other side, we have Devonte Adams. So, Jim, who are you going with, Valdez Scantling or Geronimo Allison? I actually like both. I think they're very close in value at this point. The difference is going to be that Valdez Scantling is going to be on the field when they're in two wide receiver sets, uh, not Allison. Allison and beyond when they have the three wide receiver sets, which will be often. Don't don't get me wrong. And we know that Rodgers loves to throw to that slot receiver. He has a high target percentage rate to that to that spot. So I'm not worried about that either. Um, I think Valdez Scantling has more big games, but I think that Allison is more steady and more uh, consistent from week to week. So I like both of them, and I have no problem going with either. I'll ask you, Mike, uh, Aaron Rodgers. He hasn't played in the preseason, which to me is a huge mistake when you have a new coach and a new offense. And then secondly, there's rumors of some communication issues with Rodgers and the new head coach. Does Rodgers finish the season as a top three fantasy football quarterback? Now, you can make a case for so many guys. I'm going to leave him outside of the top three. So I think Mahomes and Watson are in there. I wouldn't, uh, leaving him one spot. So I'll, I'll just sort of fade him. I think he can make top five, but not top three. And Jim, what's your thoughts on Rodgers? Top three? Yeah, I, I don't, look, he can, absolutely can. We know he can. Uh, but, you know, with the recent couple of years with the injuries showing up here and there. Uh, he's already fighting with the new head coach. You know, all of that stuff coming into play. Like like Mike said, I, I definitely have Mahomes and Watson ahead of everybody. They're the one-two combination. After that, it, it can be anybody's game. There's so many guys that are in play for that number three position that if I was a betting man, if this was a betting proposition, I would play the field. Yeah, same. All right, got Baker, uh, Matt Ryan, Wentz, Goff, like so, a bunch so of guys. Yeah. yeah, so many. For all you people out there, the L.A. Rams are up next. This is my Super Bowl pick. I believe the L.A. Rams will be the champions to get back really? there. And I think that Jared Goff in the Super Bowl will suffer an injury in the second quarter, and Blake Bortles will lead the team <laughs> to the Super Bowl. Of course. For all you Jaguar set us up. fans out there. You set us up. Uh, Jim, who, who do you got? Malcolm Brown or Daryl Henderson as the guy to get a lion's share if Todd Gurley were to get out with his athletic knee that we saw trouble him last season? All indications, all preseason have been it's absolutely Malcolm Brown's job to lose. He is the backup. You know, it's been pretty well stated by everybody. Uh, he's been the guy that's been listed as the number two all preseason. I think Henderson is going to be a decent back at some point. But while all of the hype was on him early, once we got into the preseason games and all of a sudden this guy wasn't running very well, wasn't really getting much done, all of a sudden you saw him start to fall way off. I Look, if I, I'm investing in one of them, I'm going to go right now with Brown over Henderson. Brown over Henderson. I got to ask you, Mike, the names are big. Brandon Cooks, Robert Woods, and Cooper Cup. Can three guys from the same team catch 70 balls? 
I believe so. Considering he, the he, amount he of time, balls. Con, he, he, consi- he said balls. Con, considering the amount of time that they all spend on the field together, Jim was talking about the Packers lining up, and I, I do think the Packers are going to have a a, a very consistent eleven personnel look. Aaron Jones uh, as the back, and all three of the wide receivers that we talked about. Uh, earlier in a lot of those sets. The Rams run 11 personnel well over 90% of the time. So all three of those guys, the ability to stay healthy is really going to be the only thing that would scare me away. But, I I mean, they came pretty darn close last year, didn't they? We spent most of the preseason trying to figure out which guy to draft first. All three were going in the wide receiver two range. And, yes, if you ask me to predict it, I, I'd want some odds on it, but I think all three get 70 this year. Very interesting. I'll tell you, I think the Rams actually, with all the talk out there about people's predictions right now and betting on teams to win the Super Bowl, the Rams played one bad game in the Super Bowl. And I thought, when you look at offense and defense and even the kicker, I think it's the best team in football by far. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. You know, look, they have a good team, uh, but there's plenty of other talented teams that. And it really depends on which team gets hot at the right time or New England. Or we'll stay healthy. Or we'll stay healthy here, yeah, right? Yeah. I I mean, I, I do have concerns, though. The last time we saw a team lose the Super Bowl and go back to it was the Bills. There does seem to be a Super Bowl hangover for a lot of teams. Uh, the Falcons, uh, obviously, after the 2016 season, they, they struggled in the 2017 season. And I just think that we are we have seen a very consistent pattern of a team having a difficult time to get back to the mountaintop after losing that Super Bowl. Now, to your point, top to bottom, that roster is really good. They've just been tweaking it. I think they're strong at really every uh, position group, but uh, I'm not going to have them in the Super Bowl this year. It doesn't mean that I think they'll be a bad team. I just think there could be a Super Bowl hangover. And the way that Seattle has nicely tweaked this roster this offseason, I think they're going to uh, see a challenge from the Seahawks for that division. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. If those both defensive ends get their head on straight, that's, right. that's going to be a very, very good defense. The Minnesota Vikings, Jim, uh, Dalvin Cook, of course, the guy that everybody's looking for, but a lot of love out there for Alexander Madison. Do you see him getting much work if Dalvin Cook does not suffer the injury that we're accustomed to? I think he does get enough work to be fantasy viable. He's not going to be an every week starter for you, but he'll fill it you know, flex spot at times or buys or injuries. I think he does have that capability. They're already talking about giving him goal line work, trying to keep that off Cook's plate uh, so he doesn't take that kind of pounding. And, you know, he can do a little bit of everything. So I like the kid. And, you know, of course, if Cook goes down again, this kid steps right into a premier spot. So, yeah, he's definitely somebody I like and is definitely one of my top. You know, I'm not a big fan of the term handcuff, but he is a handcuff. Mike, I got to ask you, speaking about handcuffs, I don't think anybody handcuffs the tight end, but Kyle Rudolph's been one of those guys that have been right around the top 10 the last couple of years. Uh, it's been a red zone target, but they go and draft Irv Smith in the first round. Who do you draft at tight end if you take one from Minnesota? I think you have to go Rudolph until, and they did extend him. There was a moment there uh, during the early days of the league year where we thought they might be moving on from Rudolph and in and around the draft, but they did extend him. I, I think you're in a good position with Rudolph. He may not be one of the elite guys. He never really has been, but I think he gives you some solid touches on a weekly basis. We talk about this every year. The posi- the tight end position is such a complete mess that you need somebody that can be out there on a consistent basis, at least getting you touches. And Rudolph is at least that. He's going to be a tight end one, even if it's not spectacular. Jim, I'm going to ask you this question, and I hate repeating nonsense, but I'll, I'll repeat it. The New Orleans Saints were on. I heard somebody this week, and I can't remember who it was, saying the New Orleans Saints offense is better suited to Latavius Murray than it was oh, for on. Mark Ingram, and he expects... Murray to have better numbers than Mark Ingram had in New Orleans. Jim, can you see that happening? Anything's possible. You know, I hate to say no, it can't, never, but we've seen too many things come out of nowhere to say it's not possible. But, you know, I like Murray, and I think he does fit the role well, but I thought Ingram was fine for that role as well. Hmm. I don't know. I don't see where Murray is better than Ingram in the role it's going to be. I mean, 
some early down work, some goal line back work, and you know, little things here and there. But Kamara is still the one that runs that offense. What's going on? I got to tell you right now, you got to look at this. If uh, Latavius Murray, Mike, is better or even close to Ingram, people are getting a steal in drafts right now. I agree with that, but what is the deal with the, It's been happening, Tony. Mark Ingram got drafted in 2011. We spent like eight years defending this guy. He isn't a bad player. He's been a really good, productive running back with injury issues and one suspension. There's the weird dynamic with him and Peyton where he'd get pulled out of goal line scenarios all the time, and he seemed uncomfortable with it. But he's had a productive career, and Baltimore has him on a really good contract. I know we're awaiting Justice Hill's coronation, but I, I, I just don't good understand that. Like as, as far as Latavius Murray is concerned, I, we've always seen Saints running backs be valuable. Kamar is obviously extremely valuable. We've always seen the next guy be valuable, and if one of them gets hurt, the next guy will be valuable too. They utilize their running backs well, and they score a lot of fantasy points. There you have it. The next up, the New York football giants. I'll tell you what, man. They're doing Daniel Jones a favor by not letting him start, I think, uh, because these are the names he has to look forward to. Sterling Shepard, who's banged up, Darius Slayton, Corey Coleman, Cody Latimer, Amber Etta Tuau, uh, I got to ask you, Jim. Half of those uh, names aren't even there right now. <laughs> yeah. Who the hell is going to – I forgot Benny Fowler and Russell Shepard. Uh, who the hell is going to catch balls week one for these guys? Well, Shepard is fine. He's got everything off his hand. His, his thumb seems to be fine. He should be good to go. So I'm not worried about him, and I expect him to have a good season. And then, of course, is Mark Ingram. So, I mean, you got still have three good pass catchers on the team in uh, Ingram, Shepard, and, of course, Barkley. So outside of that, you know, absolutely, who knows? Corey Coleman is done for the year already. Yep, um, yep. So, you know, I mean, a lot of things here, it's, it's just going to be totally up in the air. And we just don't know until they get in the heat of the battle. But outside of the guys we named, uh, you know, until Golden Tate gets back, there's no way I would ever invest anything in Darius Slayton, Benny Fowler, or Russell Shepard. And for all you guys that play in preseason leagues, draft Wayne Gallman next year. He owns he owns preseason. James Washington and Wayne Gallman of your <laughs> yeah, really. wide receiver one and your RB one. By the way, to be fair to Corey Coleman, I think he was done for the year before he was done for the year. Oh, Jesus. In fantasy. Well, actually, actually yeah, yeah, ever since, he was having a good camp. Well, he's have been having trouble ever since he left Todd Bridges. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> What you talk about, Willis? <laughs> uh, I got to tell you. All right. We'll go around the room. Daniel Jones, first start, Jim. What game will that be? Ooh, I'm going to say, uh, man, I'd love it to be game one, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> As to... I'm going to say game six. Game six. Mike, where do you got Daniel Jones coming into play? It is after. It's after week six because I think that's against the Pats. So... Home game against Arizona, week seven. Uh, I think the Giants might struggle early, uh, and then Jones. You is think? In. Yeah. I think the, I think the Giants will struggle early. I think it should be right around where you guys say. But for whatever reason, this owner is in a relationship with Eli Manning that's unconventional, and he You're can't let go. He You're can't let go. Uh, it's going to be week ten. And people are going to be scratching their head. But we'll see Daniel Jones, I believe, in week 10. Jim, do you think there is a scenario where the Giants are, are, are play a lot better than people think? I just think the defense isn't going to hold it together. So, Well, that's, but, that's going to be the key, the defense. They have, look, they have enough on offense, and the offensive line should be greatly improved. So they do have enough on offense, especially when you got Barkley in the backfield, that they could make a run offensively. It's whether or not this defense can come together and, Man, for whatever reason, this front office just won't invest in linebackers. Ever. They just don't believe in linebackers. I don't even know why they play It's them. a whole new regime, and they're still not doing it. Yeah, really. It's just I don't amazing. Get it. I, that's why I can't watch them when they draft. You know, when they're in the draft, when they're on, I can't watch because I know they're going to do something stupid. <laughs> Next up, the Philadelphia Eagles. Jim, I got to tell you, man, I hate drafting Eagles running backs before this season, but I think this season's the worst. Miles Sanders, Jordan Howard, Darren Sproles, and Corey Clement. I think all four of these guys can play. And that's the problem, Jim. 
I see Miles Sanders getting the ball from the 20 to 20. I think Jordan Howell gets a third down and on the goal line, and he'll get a little play. Darren Sproles is going to get the ball on third down. And Corey Clement, it won't shock me, game one, the ball on the two-yard line, Corey Clement's in the backfield, Jim. What the hell is going on in this Philadelphia backfield? Same thing that's always gone on, Tony. Just total calamity. For fantasy owners, it's always been the hardest thing to determine, just like New England. They like to use situational running backs, and they have guys that can do that. Look, I, I still think Jordan Howard is going to be the early down back. I still think he's going to be the goal line back. You know, this is a guy everybody said, oh, what a terrible season he had last year, but still over 900 yards and nine touchdowns. I, I think he, with this offensive line, he, he should get enough opportunities. I think he could hit 1,000 yards. Sanders is still growing into the role. He still has issues with picking up the blitz sometimes. He still has issues with putting the ball on the ground. He did it a few times in camp, and that those are big things. And because of that, I, I think he's a little slower to start than people think. And if this Philadelphia team gets out to a lead, I'm pretty sure they're going to run Jordan Howard right down the other team's throat as much as they can because, let's face it, Jordan Howard is definitely not the future of this team. He's on a one-year contract, and then they're going to let him go. So, you know, why are you going to beat up your new rookie that you're hoping to have for at least four years when you have Jordan Howard for this year? Just run him to death, run him to death. And if he gets him there anyway, why beat up the young guy? Uh, Mike, I got to tell you, I have Deshaun Jackson on a lot of teams. There's been a lot of talk about how him and Wentz have played well together. Jackson's dealing with a broken finger for the first week. But what are your expectations? I feel like Deshaun Jackson's at home, back with all the criminals in Philadelphia that he's accustomed to, and a criminal himself. I think this is at home, and these two people will love each other. You, this is like your second Chip Kelly reference of this podcast. But uh, Deshaun, obviously, having a guy like that that can take the top off the defense, I think can really help Wentz greatly. I, I like the move, the move that they made. Uh, will it result in a 75 catch season for Deshaun Jackson? I don't think so. You mentioned there's so many mouths to feed there. Between we haven't even mentioned Ertz yet. You have right. the four running backs. We have Alshon Jeffrey, who is obviously a big part uh, of this team the last couple of years. I, I think Aguilar is sort of on his way out, at, but our Sega Whiteside comes in. I, I just think you're going to have a really standard fare for Deshaun Jackson. Probably three or four monster games and. You're scratching your head the other weeks, uh, wondering uh, why why he's only three for thirty six. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I, I, it's going to be very interesting. He's definitely a guy more suited to the best ball format. Uh, Jim Day for the next team. I wish this podcast came out last week because I think we hit it right on the head. The San Francisco Forty Nine is. I said to Jim last week. Jim, I've watched all the games, and I don't understand how Matt Breida is not the starting running back. I drafted Tevin Coleman in leagues, and I kept thinking Tevin Coleman's back with his old offensive coordinator. But when you watch the games, Breida was the best player. Today, the unofficial depth chart comes out. Matt Breida is listed as the starting running back. Jim, I said last week that I thought we might have underrated Matt Breida in a lot of these fantasy drafts. Heck, I put something out on Sports Illustrated back at the beginning of August telling everybody not to sleep on Breida just because I absolutely I think he's much better running back than Tevin Coleman is. And, you know, the hype was on Coleman again because he was back with Kyle Shannon and they just brought him over and all of that. They paid him, yeah. Yeah, but Matt Breida is the guy that got it done last year playing through multitude injuries and just kept getting back on the field and showed a lot of grit. And all preseason, he's been better. So many beat writers are calling him the guy that they're playing, pushing all around the field. They're playing him, you know, in the slot. They're playing him outside once in a while. They're using him all over the field. And, you know, the good thing about it was up until the last week and a half when McKinnon went on IR, you could get Breida, you know, four or five rounds later in Coleman, which made him an absolute steal. All of a sudden now those two are coming much closer together in drafts or current drafts. So, uh, you know, the values kind of slipped away, but, yeah, Breida is a guy I've been all over all preseason. I have a ton of Breida. Uh, Mike, who leads the San Francisco 49ers in receptions? Dante Pettis, Marquise Goodwin, or George Kittle? Kittle. Yeah. That's an easy one for me. 80 or, or 80 over under? Over. Close, but over. I think wow. there's some regression, but I think he's over 80 catches. Wow, that's 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 a nice – He's going. He. it was funny. I've been in drafts. 
up until this week where he was going ahead of Zach Ertz, but now Ertz has been going ahead of him. Yeah. I, I mean, think Kittle should go ahead of Ertz. Ertz is gonna, definitely going to have to deal with Goddard this year. Plus, you know, there's other weapons on that field for Philadelphia this year. This yeah. year with Deshaun Jackson back with J.J. Ortega Whiteside there. You know, there's multitude weapons there. I don't think Ertz is going to have the season he had last year. Yeah, I mean, Kittle had 88 last year, so, you know, I'm talking about a 10% regression, and he's still he's still right there. I think Ooh, it'll be Mike close. But, quick math. But I think it'll be close. So the the Breida thing, though, is really interesting. For somebody like Jim that has a lot of stock in Breida, I think it's it's going to pay off huge. I have very little. I have very little of it. I, I didn't do as many drafts this year, but I have very little exposure to Brita, and I I'm regretting it. It wasn't. I I had been talking during the preseason too about how Brita, the Niners love him. If nothing else, you knew that the Niners really like him. I just think this is going to be the, the McKinnon loss clarifies the fact that they're both going to touch the ball a lot. Doesn't really matter to me, Jim, one versus two. I think they both right. get the ball enough that they'll both be relevant flex plays at least every week. And the only reason I was really talking Breed up, I, but I do believe he's a better running back, but I do agree that they're both going to get their shots, no doubt in my mind. But the reason I was talking Breed up was because he was going so much later than Coleman. You're right. Next up, the Seattle Seahawks. When you look at the Seattle Seahawks, uh, Jim, Will Disley was the talk of the preseason. Is Will Disley a guy that can crash the top 10 in tight ends? Sure he can, because let's face it, once you get past the first few, uh, like last year anyway, the rest of them were, were a total crapshoot. I think we have a few more that will solidify that top end this year. O.J. Howard staying healthy, Ingram staying healthy. Hunter Henry staying healthy should all solidify that top five, six. Uh, but outside of that, again, it's still going to be, you know, catch as catch can and who is it that's going to step up. So, you know, they like him in Seattle and they definitely need pass catches. Everybody else is kind of hurt or, or banged up. And, you know, so they definitely need to get something going. But the problem is, so is Disley. You know, yeah. he, he, he's he been sidelined too. And right now it wouldn't surprise me at all if the the number one tight end to start the season is Nick Vanette because that's all they have. Dixon has been put on IR, and Disley has missed, what, the last month almost? Yeah. This is a crazy question, Mike, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to take out Tyler Lockett. you got a banged-up DK Metcalf. you got a banged-up David Moore. Wow, you got a, ba- a banged-up Will Disley. <laughs> Who is going to lead Seattle in receptions other than Tyler Lockett? I'm just going to have to go to, I guess, Rashad Penny. In a receiving role, <laughs> I can't pick any of those receivers. I'm not going to suggest Gary Jennings is going to come out there. They cut Jerron Brown and then signed him back. So David Moore's hurt. Uh, I, I'll say Rashad Penny in a receiving role. They'll give Carson some carries and bring Penny out there uh, in order to catch some passes. So uh, it's a mess there. That's the it's the problem you have when you're trying to evaluate the Seahawks. They've done a nice job piecing together his defense. They lose Frank Clark. They sign these other guys. They're improving the offensive line. Now they have two backs. They got the QB. And then you look at the receiving core past Tyler Lockett, and you just don't, it's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing there. The only, the only problem I, I have w- with that of saying Rashad Penny is because they've already come out and said they want to get Chris Carson more involved in the passing game too. Right. Um, so if that's true, if that's what they want to do, then I can't see Penny getting there. And my vote is going to be for Metcalf. I know he's hurt, hurt now, but they're expecting him to be on the field in week one. We'll see. Uh, but I think, you know, for the season, I think Metcalf is the next one up. I just get worried about a big receiver like that already dealing with injuries. Just yeah, I agree. Linger. And he's always dealt with injuries. I get it. I get it. But there's nobody else there I feel any comfort in whatsoever. I, I, I'd have to agree. <laughs> next up is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I got to ask you, Jim, who do you got? Peyton Bobber in this one or nope. Ronald Jones? Nope. Daria <laughs> Gunbawale. Yeah, I wanna, let's get it. I, I, I didn't want to say sighting. I didn't want to say that name. <laughs> Dare Agumbawale. You gonna go with Dara? I have. I've taken him in, in quite a few drafts. Look, I, I was in the beginning of preseason when they were talking about Jones and he looked good, he was working hard and everything seemed to be going his way. I was like, okay, maybe so. Maybe so. I've never believed in Peyton Barber. He is what he is to me. He's a perennial backup and nothing more mediocre at best. Um, so I was hoping Jones would take a step up. I liked him coming out of college. I thought he would do well, but it, once the, the pads came back on 
everything started falling out of place again for Jones. Uh, he wasn't picking up the blitz very well. He wasn't catching the ball very well out of the backfield. So it's been a Gumbo Vale that's been having the really good preseason. And the thing I keep coming back to is, look, he's had the best preseason out of all three of them. And he's behind two mediocre back. So I think this guy is just going to go nuts. And I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up taking over the job and being the best back there and, you know, coming out of nowhere like Philip Lindsay did last year. Next up, the Washington Redskins. I got to tell you, this is an interesting situation. Jim, who do you got? Adrian Peterson, a Hall of Famer, arguably one of the greatest running backs of all time, or Darius Geis, 2018 first-round pick, missed the season with a torn knee. Who do you think, fantasy-wise, is the guy to go? I've seen Geis move up in drafts the last couple of weeks. Well, yeah, once he got on the field and people saw him on the field and, and looking pretty good, of course his value was going to go up on in ADP because, let's face it, he's the guy they want to be running the ball. The problem is this team is going to be so bad on offense, that offensive line, if they don't get Trent Williams back in. Now there's talk out there that they may get him back in for week two. I don't know where the delineation is or why that's happening, but they are talking about getting him back in week two, and that will help. But, you know, at this point, it's all on guys to stay healthy. The, the problem I have with that is, you know, he had the bad injury, and then he kept having setback after setback after setback. And, you know, right into the preseason, it took him all the way up until, what, the last preseason game to be able to get on the field. And that just bothers the heck out of me. So, you know, he may be the guy that gets out there, gets it done, and good for him. But, man, I'd much rather have Adrian Peterson where you can get him, you know, 80 rounds later and not have to worry about it. I'm going to ask Mike Blewett an incredibly unfair question now. Uh, Mike, I look at the receivers here. You ready to go? Terry Mm -hmm. McLaurin, Robert Davis. Paul Richardson, who's hurt, uh, Calvin Harmon, Trey Quinn, and Steve Sims Jr. When you look at this, did Dwayne Haskins ask not to play? <laughs> yeah, well, the only uh, the only positive there is that McLaurin is his college teammate. So uh, if if and when Haskins gets in there, uh, you would imagine McLaurin will get fed the ball quite a bit. So this has been a weakness of the team. Uh, Josh Doxson getting cut actually probably helped them and not by much. It probably just allows the rookies a little bit more uh, space to get into the lineup. Everything about Washington this offseason after the draft has gone south. Right now, the left side of their line is Donald Penn and Eric Flowers. So if Case Keenum is able to stay upright, I don't know how it helps Darius Geis or Adrian Peterson. I don't know if any of this stuff is relevant if they can't protect anybody. There you have it, guys. We're all ready to go. Week one of the fantasy football season. We'll be back next week for week two to break down all the action in week one, get you ready for week two. Jim, where can people find you? Uh, they can find me, of course, on Twitter at Fantasy Taz, and that's usually the easiest and best place to do it uh, just because you'll see everything else I'm doing. But, of course, now we are on the Sports Grid Fantasy Television Network every day, Monday through Friday from 1 to 2 on the Fantasy Football Frenzy. Uh, and, of course, I will, starting this Sunday, I will be doing the Roto Experts show in the morning on Sunday from 9 to 10 with Joe Pisapia. Looking forward to that. I think Davis Matek is also going to join us on there. So I'm looking forward to that. So, yeah, I've got a lot of things going on, folks. I've got podcasts on top of that. I'm starting a new radio gig every Saturday for a Tampa Bay radio station, Tony. So uh, fun stuff. There you have it. Uh, Mike Blewett, what's the deal? Where can we find you? Sunday mornings, uh, Sports Grid TV Network. I'll be doing a show also with Joe PCP. I'll be doing a DFS show sponsored by Daily Roto and then Pro Football Today uh, with a cast of characters to be named later. It looks like I'll have <laughs> Dane Martinez on there, a little Gabe Morenci. We'll get some uh, star appearances at points from Wayne Corbett and uh, another possible big NFL player, which I'm uh, not at oh, liberty Wayne to announce Corbett. just yet. I'd like to meet Wayne Corbett. I always like watching him play. Nice guy. Really nice guy. Mike did a little show with him down at a racetrack. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, I interviewed him. Oh, yeah, 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 down down at Monmouth Park. That's right. That's right. I was there. (laughs) I totally forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. So there you have it, folks. WTF Fantasy Football. I have met Wayne Corbett. Good You have. See that Jim's Damn been enlightened. Drugs. It took an hour to get Jim enlightened, <laughs> and it was all ready to go. He's at his full throttle, and now the show ends. See you next week.